The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I was going to give you, do you know that sermons, if they're done properly, <laughs> we may not do one properly today, but if sermons are done properly, you have the message before the development. Do you know that? You don't just teach a truth. There's plenty of truths in the Bible. But it, what is God speaking and then develop it, right? Well, I'll tell you what, from the beginning of this week, he's been saying one thing, look out for distractions, Beware of distractions. If thine eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. I can remember one time, Jason, there was a, a young man that I didn't really have a good feeling in my spirit about it. And Jason said, let me tell you what I saw. I saw dual vision. It's like before his eyes, there was like two sets of eyes. That's dual vision, dye vision. Very often, sometimes people, even, even in a church setting, they come mainly to see how they can promote themselves. They don't really have a vision for the house or for the people in it. They have a vision on how can I promote myself. And it's very interesting because the sad part is, is they very rarely, very rarely do you ever see it blessed and flourish. And um, this week, it was like, if thine eye be single, that there are plenty of distractions in everybody's life. But there's also something that the Lord told me when I was a, just a young pastor. He said, in order to equip a church, and I haven't heard anybody else do this, but we, if you've been here, you've heard this dozens and dozens of times. If you can train people to deal with their issues, sin. If you can teach them to deal with sin, and die to agendas, you will equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The two things that can stand in your way is an agenda. And, and it's, it's uh, probably something that I see that's even culturally being impacted by the world. You know the church gets influenced by the world. What's going on in the world does have a way of creeping in, right? And so we need to uh, be admonished to... Be careful that doesn't affect us. So I want to read you something that I believe is, is current. And that is uh, very similar to the book of Judges. We'll talk about Samson. Everybody knows the story of Samson. And if you don't, we're going to talk about it anyway, right? Because I think it's there for our instruction, reproof, correction, so that we might move forward. But the book of Judges in general tells the story of Israel's failure after the death of Joshua. Judges is a period of time between where Joshua left off and the kings took in place. Judges. But throughout the book of Judges, you see a phrase that always caught my attention because it's repeated so often. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And if you don't believe that is in the atmosphere in our culture, as a matter of fact, it's even affecting the church. All right? Uh, you will basically see that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so we're going to cover that uh, in a few moments. I really believe there's an anointing here today to break distractions. And distractions can be both good as well as sinful. It can be either. Anything that pulls you away from Jesus needs to be brought to our attention so that we move forward. And if thine eye be single, that's what he's been speaking over, the whole body will be full of light. And if thine eye is single, your whole body is full of light. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, how can you tell if you're walking in the light as he is in the light? You have fellowship with him and with one another. If you have aught with one another, you're not really walking in the light like you think you are. You're walking in, you're walking in your own inspiration and opinions. And what did the book of Judges proclaim over and over again? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Hmm? That's that, we talked about that a few weeks back, false independence. One of the things that prevents the church from maturing is that 
they love the idea that I'm not sickly dependent. And we should applaud everybody for not being sickly dependent. Learning to stand on your own two feet. But if you think standing on your own two feet, you have arrived, you enter into false independence. Right? You haven't arrived because you can stand on your own two feet. Otherwise, every teenager would be ready for all that life has to throw at them. You are maturing when you can become on your own and interdependent and you never get so clever or so smart or so spiritual that you don't think you need anybody else. I, I woke up with a song from the 70s, probably nobody here is going to know it, but I woke up in my head till I had to go look up the lyrics. Did you ever have that happen? You ever get something and it doesn't leave? So I'm going, Lord, let's, let's find out if there's anything redemptive in this secular song from the 70s. And I forget the guy's name, but it was uh, all by myself. Now, some of you older people go, I know that song. I go, oh, man, I know that. And you younger people go, what? What's, he talking about? What's he talking about? But basically, I don't recall all the lyrics, but it was, when I was young, I never needed anyone. Yeah, let me have the <laughs> Before I break into song, I might as well have the words. Yes. When I was young, I never needed anyone. And making love was just for fun. Fun. And that's the key emphasis. I'm watching people who have been saved for many, many years. They're kind of resting in the fact that they're saved. And don't let Jesus interfere with my life during the week. They want some kind of eternal security. And all of their effort is in having fun. They're focused because they have nothing else to fill their life with. Jesus isn't really fulfilling them. As a matter of fact, in some cases, they don't want them to bother them. Because it might interfere with my fun. I'll go to church if I don't stay up too late Saturday night having fun. That kind of concept, all right? But it says, and making those days are gone. Ah, that's the crucial transition. All of a sudden you said, when I was young, I never needed anybody, but those days are gone. I was busy having fun. I don't need anybody. I'm having fun. I'm independent. Just me and Jesus. I don't even belong to a local church. I belong to the larger body of Christ. That's fantasy. I remember that lady that we had when I was a young believer. She couldn't get along with anybody in the local church, but she loved those missionaries that she never met. You know, it's easy to love people you never met. Come on. But she prided herself in loving these missionaries that she never met. And they're in a foreign country. She loved them. She, oh, let's support the missionaries. Oh, let's support. But everybody in the church wanted to strangle you. You know what? You need to, let's, let's share the love in the local assembly. Now, when I was young, I never needed anyone Everything was about having fun. Those days are gone. Living alone, I think of all the friends that I've known, but when I dial the telephone, nobody's home. Oh, you were too busy having fun. You didn't need relationships. You were independent. Just you and God. Huh? I'm fixing this for the church here. This guy's totally secular. But he learned an important fact, didn't he? And probably one of the missing facts, facts in the scripture of walk in the light as he is in the light. You have fellowship with him and with one another. We skip the one another part and think we're walking in the light. Huh. And the distraction is usually something that can even be non-sinful, but you make it sin by turning it into idolatry. I've seen people caught in the idolatry of family, believe it or not. I've seen them in the idolatry of education. Those things are not bad in and of themselves. But if, it repla if it's more important than Jesus, you've got a problem. Now, he says, uh, but when I dial the telephone, no one's home. All by myself. I don't want to be all by myself. I don't want to be. Can you see what the problem was? 
I see it in the church as false independence. You suddenly, you, you realize it's just me and God, me and God, I don't need to respond to anybody. And really, the church is never going to grow and mature in the things of God until you can become healthy enough to be interdependent. That's the third level that most people do not attain to. Because you've, you've learned, I had to unlearn this as a child because like I've shared that story before. In, living in South Chicago as kids, we wanted to be grown up fast. At the age of nine, I wouldn't let my dad go in the shoe store with me that my friends would see my dad having to go with me to buy shoes. I would ask for the money, of course. I didn't have the money. Give me the money in the car. Stay here. Let me go in by myself like I'm a big boy at nine. Does that sound? That's the way of the world. But unfortunately, if that creeps into the church, you cultivate that maturity is basically independence. And there's only a half-truth there. Being independent and standing on your own two feet is part of the mission of this church. That's the vision of this church, full stature. Getting you from being always being like little birdies, opening your mouth, waiting for someone to drop spiritual worms in your mouth and feed you. Feed me, feed me. Instead, we're going to say, learn how to eat. Learn how to feed. Learn how to feed on the Word in the all three realms. You know what I mean by all three realms? The written Word. Know it inside out and backwards, but at the same time, Know how to read that word for illumination, for where you meet the author of that word. Learn how to read what's going on inside of you. There's nothing that grieves me more than by discerning of spirits, I can feel somebody hurting and they go, I don't know what I feel. Well, you know what? You got to take responsibility for that because I'm only feeling by discernment the tip of the iceberg. The other 90% is in you and you don't know what's going on. You don't know how to read your own spirit. You don't know how to read your own life. How responsible is that? Really? God gave you a life. You want to, <laughs> you're afraid I'm going to break into song. <laughs> but I really believe God was speaking something by even bringing up a secular song from the 70s. And that we need to watch out for the distractions. And it was like, learn how to know what's going on inside yourself, but also know how to read your environment. Too often we read our environment with our carnal mind. And yet in the spirit realm, I, 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 just, I just love it. I've always been a proponent that I love the spectacular and the supernatural, but most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. If you don't learn how to wean that flesh, changed lives for me is still the most beautiful supernatural event in anybody's life. It's continually getting testimonies of people from around the world basically saying, I, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I found your material and I've learned how to forgive properly for the first time. I am a changed person. That is supernatural. Transformation is supernatural. But if they don't find out what's going on inside them, they live in la-la land, being able to quote the scriptures, know everything, confess, proclaim, decree, and then not know what's going on inside of them. You've got to learn to live, read all three. You have to read the Word of God. It has to be the foundation. There's no other foundation. And that Word is a person. You've got to be able to read at that level. Secondly, you've got to read what's going on in you. Am I walking in the light? And thirdly, you need to read your environment because most people read their environment with their reasoning mind. And if there's something you don't know, you fill it with a guess. That's not a way to live. That's not the way Jesus wants you to live. He wants you to inquire of Him. He wants you to pursue Him relentlessly and inquire and be like a child and ask. That's a hard thing for me to learn in the city because in, being independent was being mature and now God comes along, comes into my life, transforms my life and tells me now I have to become dependent all over again. That's hard, right? You learn to be independent. Then he says, not only are you going to learn to be dependent on me, but you're going to learn to stand on your own two feet but at the same time, you're going to grow beyond standing at your own two feet to being interdependent. 
confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. You know what that's in there for? Not for people who don't know what they're doing, not for people to be baby, not to be, to be pampered, but so that you don't get so big and high and mighty that you don't think you ever need anybody else. Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed is the reason that, that what John Wesley did was so successful in turning a, a, uh, a perverted generation in England to a righteous nation, to where hospitals and schools and Christian things, because he pursued in a group of people accountable to one another. They would, they would say, how's your walk with the Lord going this week? If you don't have that, you're, playing, you're just playing games. Many uh, connect groups, home groups, fellowship groups, a lot of them are not really accomplishing the purpose. You have fellowship. That's wonderful to have fellowship. But if that fellowship never makes you vulnerable and open up and to make yourself accountable, you're just living, you're living in secret. And the, there's no light in that. That's dark. You can't tell in that, in that room if it's, a, if it's a table or a piano because you're not letting the light shine on it, to be honest with you and God. You walk in the light, you have to stay. Walk means you're continuing in it. There's a progression. And if you walk in the light that you have, be open and prepared and hungry and searching after God so that He would shine more light. Oh, that's an elephant in the room. I didn't see it before. Deal with it, right? Now, I just saw that <clears throat> interdependent requires a level of maturity. It's, and as a rule, the best way to do it even in the church is to have somebody that's been around a little bit longer than you that you can bounce stuff off of. If you don't have that, you're going to be in trouble. We even have some uh, advice for people who have lost uh, a spouse. For one year, make yourself accountable to somebody because you're not in your right mind for about a year. That's not a time for new relationships. That's not a time to make huge decisions. That's one of the times that no matter how mature you think you are, that's a time that you need one another. Some of the most successful situations I've seen where there's been the loss of a loved one is basically when they've made themselves accountable for a year to bounce stuff off of. Don't make any major decisions. My mom died. There was a woman who basically went through my father's papers, was trying to tell us that we were busy. Jennifer and I were too busy traveling. She was comforting him. She was comforting him, trying to get money from him, trying to see. She told, uh, we traveled in a truck and we had a car. She says, what are you doing? She was in my house where my dad lived with us. And she'd say, what are you what are you doing with the truck? Give, give your dad the truck. You take that little car and go travel. And I'm going, I don't even know who this lady is and she's standing in my house. <laughs> I'm comforting your dad. I think it was less than that, but about two weeks after she died. I think it was more like 10 days, but it was fast. And you know, he's very vulnerable at that point in time. And she didn't like it that I protected my dad. Huh? She didn't like that part. As a matter of fact, she says, I know, I know all the Baptist ministers in Rock Hill, Fort Mill, and surrounding area, and I'm going to see to it that they, that they know about you. I said, they probably don't like me anyway. But <laughs> Jennifer said, oh, how dare you? You better be careful. Lightning don't strike you. Nothing like, nothing like being in conflict and having Jennifer, all of a sudden little Jennifer, run and jump and stand in front of me. Oh, yeah? You, talk, <laughs> you talking to my husband like that? <laughs> that's, the, that's not the first time she's done that either. We did traveling ministry, and ministry was new to Jennifer. And we're doing question and answer, and one lady said, well, what do you mean when you, you know, kind of like a little bit of an attitude, not much. What do you mean when, and she goes, she jumps out of her chair and she goes, I'll tell you what he meant. <laughs> I said, Jennifer, you gotta, really got to quit doing that. <laughs> but actually, 
that lady was giving us a hard time, and it was shortly, uh, uh, you could read this wrong, maybe I shouldn't even give that part, but hmm, skip that part. <laughs> she backed off real fast. Um, anyway, but the book of Judges is a story of Israel's failure, really, and It's tragic because Israel became almost as bad as the people that they conquered under Joshua. And everyone did what was right. And God kept raising up judges to get them, to deliver them out of that. But the one that was, the Lord was speaking to me this week, and I believe this is, it pertains to the church universal, but it pertains to us to be aware of it. And that was the story of Samson. You know, um, in the message, I saw lust leads to idolatry, something you have to have. Remember I said it could be good or bad. Um, and how it interferes with your anointing. And the story in, I like, first I want to give you the scripture in the message. How many have ever heard this one? In James 1, verses 14 and 15. Now you know the message is out there, right? Lust gets pregnant and has a baby. Sin. Sin grows up and becomes a real killer. That's James 1, 14, 15 in the message. Can you see the pattern? Huh? So the lust is the killer. And in the story of Samson in Judges 13... Chapters 13 through 16, you get a little background. I'll just give you some bullet points. You know, he killed a thousand uh, Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. He set 300 foxes on fire. You remember those stories? He murdered 30 men for their clothes. Um, Samson was one of God's chosen, but he's ruled by vengeance and sex. Was he anointed of God? Yeah. He was a ladies' man who chased one woman after another. Uh, of course, the only one that was, I mean, the first woman was from Timnah, who he married despite the objection of his parents. Also didn't listen to his parents. Someone who was older, been around a little more. Nothing more dangerous than an anointed, independent person. Hmm? They don't have to listen to anybody. We had a woman that wreaked havoc once into the lives of people that were very close to me. And she said, I'm a prophet. I don't submit to any pastor. Which really, she don't submit to anybody because she was a prophet. That's dangerous. Now, it said, three women in Samson's life were Gentiles. The first was a woman from Timnah, who he married despite the objection of his parents. The second was a whore from Gaza, and the third was the only woman mentioned by name, Delilah, with whom Samson fell in love. Is that an interesting concept? Three women. Women always got him in trouble. Lust always got him in trouble. And he fell in love. Now, what we saw when we traveled, when we would minister to people on the sexual issues and lust in general, but lust and sexual issues, throughout the body of Christ, we'd go church to church, we would deal with this, we would see something that was so obvious, but we didn't have a name for it. We called it the stupids, for lack of a better term. All of a sudden, someone who was biblically literate, someone who was walking with the Lord, all of a sudden starts talking strange. If you have a friend like that, pray for them. Maybe even confront them. Like, you know better than that. Like if all of a sudden they start saying stuff that's strange, like, well, you know what? You know, and they'll come up with something and you go, what happened to them? They got the stupids. Samson got the stupids. Clearly. Listen to this. You know, he was supposed to have had a Nazarite vow which means you're separated out for God. That was why his hair was long and, and et cetera. And you're to live a holy life. Okay. <laughs> Judges 6, 1-3. Now Samson went to 
Gaza, Gaza and saw a harlot there, and he went into her. I'd say he was not separated to God living a holy life. What do you think? Lie number one. After he visits all of these, he finds this Delilah. Now, if this isn't the stupids, listen to this and tell me if your rational mind goes, what? Delilah says, please tell me where your strength lies. I'm sure she was caressing him and stroking him. Please tell me where your strength lies. What might cause you to be bound to afflict you? And Samson said to her, he lied. If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings and not yet dry, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings. <laughs> the enemy, here, here, not yet dried, and she bound him with that. Now the men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he broke the bowstrings, the strands of yard. And so the secret of his strength was not. Now, I don't know about you, but I would only have to have that happen one time. <laughs> so when we saw stuff like this when we were traveling, people that were biblically there, and they would come up with. Remember that one? She was a solid, she, uh, the, the pastor was grooming her for ministry. And all of a sudden, one day, he said, I can't get through to her. Dennis and Jennifer, can you talk to her? And we talked to her. My son, she was a single parent, needs a father. And the next man that knocks on the door, that's the one. The guy that knocks on the door was under heavy medication. He was under he was clinical. He thought he was Jesus. That's mental illness. And the thing that she wouldn't listen to reason was, I've got to have a father for my son. I've got to have a father for my son. I've got to have a father for my son. And nobody could get past that. She got a father for her son and lost her son due to the situation of the whole marriage. It became dangerous. She was seen as unfit and lost the very child that she just had to have a father for. The stupids. So Samson here, he lies to her, and it didn't work. The second lie. Then Delilah said to Samson, look, you've mocked me and told me lies. I'm trying to get you beat up and captured, and you won't tell me what your strength is. You're mocking me. If you love me, you won't mock me. I had living here a little bit. Somehow, when you got the stupids, it works. You can say dumb things like that, and it works. That's what's so amazing to me. It worked. Samson, man of God, separated, anointed. And he bought into it. But not totally because he lied to her again. And he gave her some other uh, story. He basically said, you know, okay, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like other men. Therefore, Delilah took new ropes and bound them with. What an idiot! Why? Why would you say, okay, do it again? I love you. And then she says, Samson, the Philistines are. How did she know all the time? Why was she the trumpet? that announced the impending doom of the Philistines. Because she was... <laughs> but, oh, and it didn't work. Oh. Verse 13 and 14, this is in chapter 16 of uh, Judges. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. You just tried to get me captured and killed twice. <laughs> but I love Delilah. Is there something that you love so much <laughs> that you got the stupids? Huh? Think about it. Delilah said, until now you've mocked me and you tell me how you may be bound and if you weren't, 
and if it were, if you weave the seven locks and da, 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 you wove it tightly and da, 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 and the Philistines are upon you, he awoke out of his sleep and pulled out the button and the web from the loom and everything didn't work. The fourth time. And this is the way torment works. This is the way seducing spirits work. They wear over a period of time. That's why it's always important to pray like David prayed. Lord, search me for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Search me, O oh God, that for any secret faults. You know what secret faults mean? I don't know what's in there. But there might be something that could cause me to get presumptuous, you know, enter into presumptuous sin. Reveal to me secret faults. But the fourth time he told the church. Then she said to him, How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times. You didn't let yourself be captured by the enemy these three times and mocked me. Is there anybody in the room that would be thinking like Samson right now? I want to pray for you right now. Like, you got a point there. I think, you know what, I'm just going to tell you the truth. You wore me down because I lust you. I mean, I love you. Yeah. That's the way addiction works. The fourth time, she pestered him daily. Ah, the wear down tactic. Pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to the point of death. <laughs> and so what did he do? He buckled, he folded like a deck of cards. I don't want to be disrespectful for a man that was raised by God, but to me he was as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> really. He had the stupids, but lust will do that to you. It'll take an intelligent, anointed man and mess with your head. Then he told her his heart, okay, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, my strength will leave me and shall become weak and be like any other man. Wow. Wow. How many know what happens? They got him. And here's something that stood out to me this week when God kept saying, if thine eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. First thing they did was plucked out his eyes. And what was his problem? He had roving eyes too, didn't he? He had the call of God on his life, but he had roving eyes. He was a man anointed and raised by God, but he had eyes. I don't think you would call him a one-woman man, would you? But I'm going back to what the Lord said from the very beginning. To grow a congregation to maturity. He said this when I was 29 years old. To grow a congregation to maturity. I don't want uh, people who could, don't want Jesus interfering with their life. I want people who are hungering for transformation. There's a huge segment that doesn't want transformation. They want to feel safe and secure with a salvation experience, but I don't want Jesus bothering me all week long. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. I don't want any interference. And believe it or not, there's quite a few like that. But God said, if Dennis, if you will just do two things, you will equip saints to do the work of the ministry. Teach them how to deal with sin. Don't just preach about sin. Teach them how to get rid of it. Redemption is the name of the game. Secondly, how to die to agendas. Because the agendas are the things that have destroyed more people. Sin, they can deal with it if they're in relationship with people. But agendas, agendas is an idol. And it basically separates you from healthy relationships. And you just move toward that agenda, that agenda, that agenda. Somebody just texted me a, a quote from somebody else in light of what we teach. Forgiveness happens once. Resentment, you have to do it over and over again every day for years and months. Right? Resentment is very time consuming. Wouldn't you be better off just forgiving? 
and taking advantage of the grace that God has provided. Now, to deal with an issue is a product of really negative emotions that could be resolved because they're open doors and that can be resolved by forgiveness. Uh, as Vicki pointed out one time when we were doing a seminar, I says, what do they mean by toxic emotions? And I said, well, they're hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. If you're experiencing them, you have an open door to be tormented and to be moved off course. And I wrote it down, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. And Vicki said, look at the first letter of each of those. H-F-L-A-G-S. Hell flags. And we've been calling them that ever since. Hell flags are... Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. If you're experiencing them, and you need to know what's going on inside of you, if you're experiencing them, they're an open door. You give place to the enemy. The enemy can now torment. And he can torment, and when he torments, just like he did with Samson, over and over and over again. Wouldn't you rather repent and forgive and get it out of the way than living that as a lifestyle? You're, those are not happy people, by the way. The second thing was, to die to an agenda. An agenda in the Bible is actually called idolatry. And it can be tricky, but it's a product of lust. It's something we want more than God, and it's a product of lust. Now, this is more Gen Jennifer's area, but I was intrigued by the fact that, that the discovery that the brain actually changes. So it's physical. It starts out as sin, but sin affects your soul and your body. Whatever you do to your soul affects your body. Whatever you do to your spirit affects your soul, your body. You're all connected. And they found out that it was once believed that after massive brain reorganization during infancy and childhood, the brain was hardwired and unchangeable. That's pretty much the way I grew up thinking. You know, like when you're older, you're already set in your ways, you can't change. And they found that that's not true. That the, that the brain, for the past few decades, has exploded in the field of neuroscience, especially in the study of the emotions and neuroplasticity. And basically, the brain is moldable even in old age. And there's a battle going on. And there's the battle of even the release of the chemical, right? Oxytocin and dopamine. And we just read an article recently about, from a chemist who was a non-Christian. And the chemist said, dopamine is the most evil chemical in the face of the earth. Interesting. Because dopamine produces lust. Lust produces dopamine. It's a cycle. So a person who's addicted is not even, technically not even addicted to that substance. They're addicted to the dopamine that that substance produces. And that's something. So you can, you can be to, uh, uh, addicted to uh, something that is not necessarily sinful in and of itself, and you can be addicted to something that is sinful. But the point is, the addiction is the problem. And it gets you off track. Obviously, Samson's was a little more obvious, wasn't it? He was, he was a womanizer. And clearly addicted. But isn't it interesting that his eyes were plucked out to where if thine eye be single, there was a point even before his death where that was no longer an issue. That's the hard way. I'd rather deal with it in my heart when you bring it to death in your heart the only time he could stay focused on God was when he couldn't focus on anything else oxytocin is the molecule of love and bonding now this is saved people or unsaved people Oxytocin, when a man falls in love with a woman, there is a release of oxytocin chemically, saved or unsaved, and they bond. All right? You can have good bonds and you can have bad bonds, but when a baby is born, there's a release, a huge release of oxytocin for mother and father. 
and they bond to the child. Thirdly, when a believer is born again, that's when it gets good. There's a release of oxytocin when you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit enhancing even that. Superior to it, obviously. So how many of you, when you first got born again, were had your own recognition that other Christians were like brothers and sisters. That's a supernatural bonding that you can't explain it with the reasoning mind, but it is something that happens whether you understand it or not. That's a bonding. Now, with an addiction, you have... <clears throat> by the way, some of the characteristics of oxytocin, which is a chemical, calming, causes a peaceful mood, it allows for increased trust. So just think an unsaved person can all of a sudden, if they're healthy, have a sense of trust. It induces tender feelings, generosity. It strengthens emotional attachment. It brings down walls. It allows unlearning to happen, to change our image of ourselves for the better if we have an adoring partner. If you don't have an adoring partner, get a dog. And then believe that I want to be the kind of man or woman my dog thinks I am. That'd be good for you. <laughs> molecules of oxytocin are considered molecules of relationship. It reinforces bonding. But here's the thing. This is what Jennifer likes to bring up, Hebb's Law. Right? You've heard this before. Hebb's Law, what wires... What fires together, wires together. Romans 7, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. <laughs> Hebb's law simplif simplifies that neurons that fire together, wire together. This creates a larger, more efficient pipeline for repetitive thoughts and actions. So if you do something over and over again, like, I doubt if there's anybody here that even in a, in a, in a, Half awake stage, you could go two plus two is four, two plus two is four. Because that's built such a such a, a a routine in your mind that it's automatic. You don't even think it's almost involuntary. Two plus two is four, two plus two is four. But when it's a bad habit and it's like that, it needs to be broken, doesn't it? Two pleasure centers in the brain, and they're they're battling for space. One is satisfa satisfaction. A center that brings satisfaction. The other one is never satisfied and always has craving and wants more. And they battle for space no matter how old you are. There's a battle going on. There's only so much space. It's, it, the plasticity is there, but it battles for space. And it's like, and apparently in Samson's case, the lust took over for relationship, I would say. That's when you ignore mother and father. A drug addict will steal from mother and father because they're basically erased. I could see why that chemist said dopamine is the most evil chemical in the world. So these oxytocin and dopamine are what they call neuromodulators. Jennifer should be doing this. Neuromodulators means it changes the brain. All right. Now, Dopamine is the molecule of lust, and it can be called the most evil chemical. Lust is only concerned with pleasing itself. It's the epitome of selfishness. Lust uses other people as objects of personal gratification. Dopamine creates brain traps of addiction and you go through the same old, same old, same old. How many in here, let's just pray this through. I want to see that what the Lord spoke to me this week about distractions. They can be sinful, and they can be legitimate. But if it's keeping you from the path of God, let's ask the Holy Spirit to really reveal that to us. Yeah. We prayed with a lady who was a quality Christian. Again, these were people that I, I would have loved to have molded and mentored into a place of leadership, but they get distracted. Don't let that be your testimony. She says, 
oh, I love this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be an instructor. But you know what? I always wanted a house on the beach. And misused the scripture, that's when you knew the stupids were coming in because she was biblically literate. She'd say, doesn't God give you the desires of your heart? Mm. And sometimes he'll give you what you're asked for and send leanness into your soul too. But got to have that beach on the house. Got to have that house on the beach. Gotta. She finally got a house on the beach, could not find a church, had no friends, but she had what she wanted, the house on the beach. That agenda, believe it or not, interfered and became a distraction to her destiny and her fulfilling her destiny. And they're very sad, lonely people. I was sharing with people in the business world, it's the same as true uh, for CEOs who their entire agenda was their job. Their, right? What happens when they retire? If their identity has not been solid in God relationally, once they retire, it's like what's, there's nothing worth living for. And you know what I've watched them do? Fill it with fun. I'm saying, my goodness, we've gone full circle now. We've got young people in their 20s and 30s who don't take church seriously. They don't want Jesus to interfere with their fun. I'll go to churches as long as it doesn't interfere with my fun. I have, I've got a Saturday night where I'm going to party, and if I'm too tired to go to church, then I, I don't go because it will interfere with my fun. Now they're retired, been in the church for 40 or 50 years, and the whole emphasis is going back to having fun. Jennifer was appalled. Her father was a lawyer's lawyer. He wrote, what, law books. And he was, uh, what was his position in the state of Florida? He was the, the, attorney, for the, the attorney for the auditor general, general of, the of the state the and the governor. And matter of fact, they said he was being paid more than those other two posts. <laughs> his job was that significant. But when he retired, he did not invest in any young lawyers. He didn't do anything except got in a, use, in a trailer and just traveled and looked at the scenery. If that's your idea of retirement, you've missed your calling somehow. Not that not vacations are wrong or anything like that, but do something with your life other than mere existence. And if you have a real big nest egg, you're in danger too, because when you retire, you'll sit and do nothing and try to have fun. So you can, you can f f get caught in that loop or that distraction. And the Lord's been speaking this all this time. He says, you know what, Dennis? What you and Jennifer have done from the time you got saved was you just keep moving forward and you just don't stop. And I'm recommending you do the same thing. You keep moving forward and don't stop. And don't ever think you've arrived or that you need to take a break. Temporary breaks, yeah, but not a break from life. And resort back to fun. Wow, this preacher doesn't like me having fun. <laughs> not if it replaces Jesus. Not if it's a substitute for my people that have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves a substitute. And these substitutes, a lot of times, do not appear to be sinful, but they are an agenda and they are idolatry. And you place more importance on them than Jesus. The other, the other one that I've seen is bless us for no more. Suddenly their ministry is just their family. Unsaved people did that. I remember the Lord getting me to back off my family because I was beating them over the head with the Bible very gently. <laughs> And God basically says, I've called you to ministry. You take care of my house, I'll take care of your house. I start taking care of his house and people I didn't know and start ministering to them. People who came out of the woodwork and were witnessing to my mom and dad. Matter of fact, my dad called me up angry one time. He goes, did you send that Xerox salesman to my office? <laughs> I went, no, why? He's telling me about Jesus and I don't need to get saved. You sent him, didn't you? I went, no, I didn't send him. I don't even know him. You take care of my house, I'll take care of your house. You take care of my business, I'll take care of your business. 
And quite frankly, all of your businesses, I hear this word, especially in the 20s and 30 age bracket, I hear this word, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. Well, if you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, either way, <laughs> either way. I've seen where if your business is more important than Jesus, that business, you want, in, you want to be creative. You want the intuitive to flow up in your life. It needs to be surrendered to him. I, don't, I, I saw we had a salesman once, right? He said he was just barely surviving until God dealt with him. He said, you know what? You give that job to me. And you start tithing. Well, I just about had a heart attack. You know, you're not a member of the church if you don't give finances. Really. Because where your treasure is, your heart is. And guess what? You do tithe. The question is, where does the first 10% go? There's your God. Where does the first 10% of your money go? There is your idol. So everybody tithes. Just a question of to who and where. Right? Well, I lost track on that one. <laughs> distraction. How many know that good things can be a distraction? Poor, poor Jennifer, I remember until when I met her and I ran into her, her father, it was real evident that he did not see the idolatry in it, but for him, education was an idol. Did you know you can take something good and make an idol out of it? To such a degree that the person no longer exists, only the agenda. And people are just there to fulfill the agenda. And if they don't, there's no need. So let's pray right now. Father, reveal to us secret faults, agendas. I don't want double vision. Reveal to me an agenda that is more important to me than God. Good things are obviously sinful things. I do not want to in this time, stage in the church to make ready a people prepared. I do not want to be caught up in a distraction. Until, and I, I want to pray this for all of the people who are in business, whether you're an employee or you're an owner, I want you to relinquish it back to God. Relinquish it back to God. It's God's business, not mine. It belongs to Him and not to me. I'm a manager and a steward. I am not an owner. If you own your own business and you see yourself as an owner, you're going to probably have to die to that. You are not an owner. You are a steward. Everything that you have belongs to God. How many of you know Romans 14.4? Let's pray it for our businesses, our jobs. If you're an employee, you work for Jesus. You'd be the kind of employee that would honor God, not when, the, not when the boss is looking or when he's not looking. When your heart's right, you're doing it as unto the Lord. You're working for Him. You're God's servant. So, Father, right now, as an employee, I'm going to work as unto you, Lord, not when someone's watching or not watching, but how I am in private my attitude toward that job. As a matter of fact, there's some people going to get promotions. You know how you get promotions? You be the best person you can be on that stinky job because a lot of times the promotion comes when your attitude gets adjusted. So Father, would I be the best person I can be on that stinky old job <laughs> and my attitude is right, then I'm, my heart is prepared for promotion. And until then, I need an attitude adjustment. So, Father, right now, reveal distractions to us and cause us in the Spirit to know not to go that way. In Jesus' name.
You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.